What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. Coming up, the fellas load up their B-17 and head for the wild blue yonder in 1943's Air Force. Reeling from Pearl Harbor, a bomber crew goes to great lengths to pay the dastardly Japanese back. All this and 8,000 pounds of American gratitude this week on For Screen and Country. Look to the skies, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, thank you. Wow. Amazing. So many planes. I, I've never seen so many planes of such historical vintage in the air. There they go. Off into the horizon. Yes, hello, hello, yes, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, Jason McLeod, your host, here on a podcast called For Screen and Country. Thank you, Brendan. And that is my co-host and my editor, my producer, my uh, agent, my uh, uh, manager, my direct manager, mm. and my friend, Brendan. And if you had a party and invited everyone that you knew, I think I'd probably get you the biggest gift. Mm. And the card would say... Just because you're most of the people I know. Yeah. And, and the card inside would say, uh, happy birthday, because it'd probably be like your birthday or some shit. What a nice guy. <laughs> Brendan, we are coming to you and this great audience here live from the beautiful harbor mm. of Pearl. Of Managua. Here oh. on the island that it's on in Hawaii. <laughs> yes, the island that it's on. We yes, sir, do it's... our research here, Jason. We do. And, and I want to give a big thanks to the 165th Catering Regiment of the Hungarian Air Force who put on that little display for us, uh, uh, flying B-17s and uh, uh, P-40 Lightnings overhead for us to enjoy for this podcast here live in Pearl Harbor. Yes. And, and Jason, I can totally understand why we were tripped up a little bit. It is a very... Um obscure island here in hawaii of course the island of honolulu nobody ever thinks of it uh, certainly um, it, no it's it's an obscure name and it's hard to pronounce it's very hard to pronounce it's definitely not pronounced just as it's spelled no. No. but no. yeah we are we're here we're queer get used to it Mm-hmm. other than that though uh, uh how's your week been <laughs> Are we doing that now? We're going to do a, a week update? Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. that's not what we do, Brendan. It's just, it's what do we do? It's Saturday Night Live, but it's a weekday update. <laughs> uh, no what do no we do? updates from me, Brendan. Tell them what we do. All right, well, what we do is we talk about the 100 greatest war films of all war time, according to Paste Magazine. And uh, this week, uh, we're talking about one of them, but... Uh, Jason, before we get into that, before we start discussing, breaking down, talking, collaborating, we got to read some comments uh, about last Ooh. week's movie. And that would be, of course, A Walk in the Sun. Jason, it was very hard to sift through all these comments. Uh, people from far and wide came to tell us about A Walk in the Sun. Everybody under the sun has taken a walk in it so tell me uh we got a lot of uh rocking and rolling people talking about uh this movie yeah i agree like it is pretty intense for a propaganda movie in world war ii like i mean you've got these guys they're going into this situation it's pretty scary you know it's it's not pretty a sure scary. thing well it's not a sure thing they're gonna win it's not like it's yeah. not the typical old school like glorious propaganda that we're marching through and the japanese are falling down in front of us no it's there's some shit going down and they and they then they go through it 
Well, what I like about it too, and I think we talked about it in the episode, but I like that they 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 kind of blanket it as if it's like a propaganda gung ho kind of movie, not the movie mm. gung ho, um, but certainly like in that in that vibe and. I, especially when we like when we talked about the finale of the movie like it's mm. uh, so many of them get killed but it's yeah. not treated with a lot of weight but i think that's intentional to yeah. make you be like wait a second wait, we're getting this like r- roll ro- uh, holly jolly <laughs> not holly jolly it's not christmas but we're getting this like upbeat kind of music yeah and the theme song kicking back in and lloyd bridges has his uh has his apple that's what he has right yeah yeah, and and, and we're all heading back, but the, the movie's like, take a look around, though. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. The movie's like playing out almost like a, it's like he, Milestone is playing out a typical Hollywood movie, but it's amongst the corpses of everybody that died. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, the censors look, it's fine. See, we're doing what we're supposed to do. And maybe they don't notice the corpses on the ground, but the hope is that the audience walks up going, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wait there a sure tick. was a lot of dead bodies on the ground, and they don't seem too, uh, too sad over it, which, nope. hey, that's war. Well, Jason, our second and final comment comes from uh, Adam Pellman, who I guess I guess he's old. I guess that's how we. I guess that's how we're uh, we're working it on huh? this guy, Adam Pellman, alive during World War II. Uh, great to great to hear uh, an old an elder an elder mm-hmm. speak out uh, on this podcast. Adam Pellman says, "I like this one a lot. A prime example of the Men on a Mission war film. By the way, cast Mabel and Mo and Oscar in a war movie, and I'm there." Uh, that's a wrestling reference I, for three people. I do want to see Mabel Hall and his big butt through the uh, uh, through the the various jungles in the Pacific. No, see no, how dude, long he is, makes it. Oh shit! Okay, and this is a joke for even less people. But this is what you do: you put Mabel in a movie, kind of like Platoon, and by uh-huh. the end, he gets so fucked up from the war, he becomes Viscera. Well, that would fill in a big hole in his life. <laughs> <laughs> it's like maybe ma- yeah. he was. He like, was. How did he become this? He was he Mabel. Went to right? He was Mabel, and then he fell through a time hole, and he went yeah. to Vietnam. Yeah, and and he and he came back, and when mm-hmm. and when he him when we hit when he himself in the nineties as Mabel fell through that time hole, he yeah. who had already gone back in time reemerged as Vizera. Exactly. Vince McMahon, call me. <laughs> Um, anyway, the rest of that comment goes. <laughs> Plus, it's got Sterling Holloway, the voice of Winnie the Pooh, as one of the soldiers. It's always momentarily perplexing to hear that voice coming from anyone other than Pooh. I kept waiting for his character to get shot and say, oh, bother, before passing away. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's funny. And it's like there's so many actors that have voices that are like that. It's And it's something we see across culture. But where something becomes so parodied and so, like, memed, if you will, Brendan, mm-hmm. um, over will. time that it that it eventually kind of loses all meaning and, and becomes like becomes like a, a cliche or, a, you know, some sort of whatever. Like, it becomes a, an integral part of culture. And, mm-hmm. and Winnie the Pooh is one of those voices that, you know, it's just you hear it coming out of anybody, whether it's Sterling Holloway or somebody doing that style of voice. It's like, yeah, it's Winnie the Pooh. Well, Jason, it's like fucking you... bogey. Nobody, nobody can get away with talking like bogey because it just sounds like doing a fucking bogey impersonation. I, I don't know if you uh, if you saw this little comment, but uh, uh, Sergeant Charger Williams Holt actually chimed in on that comment and said, uh, and and this is this is for you, brother. Um, he says my favorite is the original Star Trek episode where John Fielder, voice of Piglet, plays Jack the Ripper. Yes, he does. <laughs> I know that, that episode is called A Wolf in the Fold, and does he uh, sound Scotty... like Piglet? Well, I mean, it's the guy's voice, so I mean, I'm sure he might try to pitch it up a little bit. But it, to be fair, that's it's not it's not my favorite episode of Star Trek, and it's been a while since I've seen it. I don't like Scotty being put in a position where he's thought to be a rapist, even though he makes comments that that seem like he could absolutely be a rapist. But it was the uh, '60s, Brendan. You know what? I'm just going to uh, take that co- no context added to that. Please just leave it as is, and we're going to move <laughs> right along. We're going we're gonna to take to the skies, Jason, because this week we are talking about the film Air Force. Everybody salute the sky, because without it, we wouldn't have airplanes, would we? Let the mighty eagles soar like they never, ever soared before. The Air Force is America's shore. In the sense that it's in the air, if the air was sort of an ocean. Air Force. Special thanks to uh, former uh, head of Homeland 
Security, no, Attorney General John Ashcroft for his version of his famous song, Let the Eagle Soar. How? That he allowed to be sent back in time to be used as the theme to Air Force. I can't. Uh, uh, Why did you thank John Ashcroft on our show? Because <laughs> he wrote it. <sighs> Jason, we're talking about Air Force 1943. Now, you might see a little similarity, a little simpatico with last week's movie, because not only are they both old as fuck and everyone in this movie is surely dumb and dead, but mm-hmm. um, it's also a movie, much like last week, where the film was released two years, actually maybe even a little less than that, after the events in question that are depicted in said film, because this movie is about, uh, well, not completely about, but it's certainly the starting point, is the December 7th, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, and this movie was released in 1943. Early 43, I believe, as the the studio was trying to get this movie done for uh, December 7th, 1942, which is, it was not to be absolutely insane. (laughs) Like Howard Hawks is a crazy person. Did they have a lot of cocaine back then too? Uh, they, back in those days, they were starting to get like methamphetamine and stuff. They were getting the good shit. Okay. So, so maybe like, 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 so, so methamphetamine would make you work faster and harder. Okay. Okay. So, so everyone was methed out. And uh, mm-hmm. trying to get these movies made as quickly as possible. That is a that is a quick turnaround from a very real disaster. Um, Absolutely. But Air Force 1943, of course, the Royal, not the Royal Canadian Air Force. That's a that's a television show. Um, yes. But let me let me just let's just talk about who's in this movie because oh man, there were no stars in the sky, Jason, because they're all in this movie, all a bunch of names that I don't <laughs> recognize. Um, because I'm, I'm not, uh, 95 years old, but <laughs> all a bunch of actors who hadn't gotten drafted. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Bunch of people with bone spurs. Uh, we got, uh, yep. John Ridgely as Captain Quinn Cannon. We've got Gig Young as Lieutenant William Williams. We've got Arthur Kennedy as Lieutenant McMartin, Charles Drake as Lieutenant Monk Hauser Jr., uh, Harry Carey, which made me do a double take and then realize it was not yeah. the baseball announcer, yeah. <laughs> uh, playing Master Sergeant Robbie White. Um, and then actually a name I did recognize, uh, John Garfield as Sergeant Wanaki. Uh, James Brown, not the Godfather of Soul, as Lieutenant Radar. And last but not least, uh, Ray Montgomery as the fresh fra- fresh faced apple pie, sweet as honey, American original private Chester. Is he the one that gets shot in the plane? He is the oh gee shucks. I'm sure glad to be here with the yeah. Air Force. God, you know what but we're isn't doing? He the guy that, what we're doing, it's is just he, is he fun. The guy, no, but is he the guy that they come up to uh, Winaki and him and they're like, I need a gunner for this recon mission. And he's like, well, I'll go. And they're like, "Oh, that kid's green as grass." He doesn't. He doesn't get. He gets shot on the ground. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. This. But this is the guy that's like, "Oh, gee, Wilkers, I'm sure glad to be in the Air Force." Oh, it's a golly swell. Gee, golly, holy, holy gosh, my gosh, kind of guy. Every war movie made in the '40s had to have at least one of those characters <gasps> by law. I mean, every propaganda war movie, I think, because <laughs> Jason, the first thing we need to talk about. I know you're going to talk. Uh, talk uh, briefly about what the plot is here, but this is a one thousand percent confirmed a propaganda f- movie. Yeah. It's it was a uh, script had approval by the government, um, and it was made as a yeah as a morale boosting film. Mm-hmm. So uh, so so th- so tell us tell us what this movie's about. Well, this movie is about in seventeen a, it, syllables. Based- it's based on a true story, although I, in my brief internet travels, I didn't find any reference to the original story of what actually happened with the Marianne. But uh, it's based on a story of uh, bombers, B-17s that were, in, may, in fact, fuck, I don't know, they may not even been B-17s in real life. But no, they were B-17s that were heading to uh, Hawaii on December 6, 1941, transferring over there and loaded for bear with everything except ammunition. Mm-hmm. And... They head over there, and as they're going, they get word that, well, they're, they're calling into the, the airfield to land, and they, they cuts out. And then they realize very quickly, as they fly overhead of the airfield, in one of the really cool miniature scenes in this movie, mm-hmm. we see Pearl Harbor from the air on fire. 
Yes. And they're like, oh, shit. It, uh, it takes them way too long, by the way. Uh, excuse me. I would probably figure this out pretty quick. It takes them way too long to figure out that it's Japanese uh, on the radio. <laughs> like, Well, don't they at first, aren't they like, what is that, like Chinese? Chinese? And I'm like, what? what you're it's not like, a- do you not have any idea of what the geopolitical situation in the world is? Do you think the Chinese could invade or attack the United States? And, I don't think so. And Japanese also, sure could. And also, Jason, as we know from last week's movie, the Battle of Tibet won't happen until 1956. That's right. They got lots of time before that happens. Right. Um, so, yeah, so the Japanese, they, they make their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Our uh, heroes uh, in the Marianne, the bomber Marianne, end up getting diverted to emergency fields. And while they're on the ground making some minor repairs to their landing gear and trying to get, they need to, they do want to eventually get to the airfield because they want to be able to help, mm-hmm. maybe get loaded up with ammo and stuff. Uh, they start getting attacked by like snipers. Uh, just start taking pot shots at them. Yeah, they're Must be partisans. They're in the Philippines, is where they are. No, that's uh, uh, they're on. They're in Hawaii. But they start going into the Philippines, though. That's that's part of that's part of it. They, they eventually, yes, 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 no, for sure. That's so. So the beginning of the movie, they go. They learn about Pearl Harbor uh, as they learn <laughs> about school, Pearl Harbor in a class in school. <laughs> Once they've taken the test, they have that teacher. They, just, they, they have that they, teacher they, from All Quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> They, uh, they all break up and they go land at emergency fields all across the uh, Hawaiian Islands, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, they start getting sniper shots, to, to, uh, you know, pot shotting at them. So they, they get the fuck out of Dodge. They take back off. They get in the air. They get in contact with the airfield and they end up landing there. And of course, it's all hell. The runway's fucked. Uh, everything's on fire. Um, and yeah, at that point, then they start to, then they get loaded up and they're told to head for the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And so they head for the Philippines. And and this is really what, a lot of this movie is in transit, uh, in the plane. Yeah. Uh, no elephant, though, just a, just a little baby dog no. that they pick up from some Marines at Wake. This is the second movie in a row we've referenced a movie that we didn't discuss on this podcast. Yeah, not on this podcast. <laughs> but yeah. we did, uh, if you want to hear that, folks, um, just head on over to What Were They Thinking and listen to our discussion on Operation Dumbo Drop. If that episode is up now, I'm not good with calendars. It could just be coming soon. Who knows? <laughs> Eventually, it, 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 it chances are the person listening to this isn't listening to this day one. So they better be. It's probably if you listen to it on yeah, day well, two, it's a whole be. other episode. It's expired. I make <laughs> I make very subtle edits every day. That's right. Every day, you're always you're always editing. You're always um, editing. That's my that's my life. So they they set out for the Philippines, but they got to land at Wake Island to uh, check in there and and get fuel. Yeah. And while they're there, that's when they come upon their dog Tripoli, who joins the crew. Uh, who has been trained to bark at the mention of Mr. Moto. I'm not exactly sure who they're talking about, whether I was, it's not Tojo. No, I was very confused. I, I didn't know what that was other than, because, I mean, at one point they're like, what do you think of the Japanese, Triple E? He's like, rawr, rawr. they're like, that's right. So I'm assuming it's just like he, he hates Japanese people. They're just conditioning the dog to be racist. I don't know. You know what it is? I just I, I googled it and it immediately comes up. It's uh, it, it, I assume it's it's like a slang term for just j- j- Japanese people because oh, Mr. Wonderful. Moto is a fictional Japanese secret agent created by American author John P. Marquand. Hmm. He appeared in six novels by Marquand, purchased uh, purchased published between 1935 and 1957. Oh, so, so they're probably very sensitive portrayals of Japanese I people. I have to imagine. Uh, uh, well, let me tell you, uh, there's a movie version called Thank You, Mr. Moto, and I would like you to guess who plays Mr. Moto. <gasps> well, if it's not Mickey Rooney, I'm going to say <laughs> that it's... Um, uh, uh, um, why can't I think it was... Richard Burton. <laughs> Not good, good, uh, good guess. No, in fact, it is played by the great Peter Laurie. Of course. Yes, I am Mr. Moto. <laughs> well, you know, Peter Laurie, he's that uh, foreign looking fella. We'll get him. Yeah. And well, they, I mean, I'm looking at a picture of him as Mr. Moto and it's like he's squinting his eyes and he's got glasses on and his hair's like combed really oh, nice. Oh, dear. Well, that's Hollywood, baby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they so they stop at Wake now in the war. Uh, this would have been a few days. This is one of the few accurate things in this movie. Uh, yeah, that very it was few. Right, uh, that Wake was taken a few days later. Like it was, it was wasn't right away, but it was pretty quick. Mm. In, early in the war, that Wake Island was taken and was held by the Japanese until 1945. Jason, really, um, the accurate accuracy of this movie is that Pearl Harbor happened. Um, pretty much, and well, that we, we will get to that. Yeah. 
they fought they fought to reinforce the defense of the Philippines and then that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, so then they get to the Philippines and they of course they want to check in with uh, the crew chief uh, 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 played by Harry Carey. His he's been going on about his son this whole time. So of course we're all like, okay, well his son's obviously going to die because he keeps he's so proud of him. He's like, oh, he's a first lieutenant. I'm going to have to salute my son and this and that and. Yeah. I'm so proud of the boy, you know, and then, of course, they get there and he asks him to, to look in on him and the uh, captain, uh, uh, what's the captain's name? Uh, Quinn Cannon. Quimbo. Quinn Cannon. Quimbo. Captain Quinn Cannon asks about him and he's like, ah, oh, yeah, he got killed in the attack. Here's some shit that he had. Take it back to his dad. It's and very So, yeah, he gives it to his dad and that's kind of the last we hear about it. Um Because, you know, I understand he's, a, he's still a soldier. He's still got a job to do and he's going to do it, but... Yeah. It's just like, oh, my son's dead, and he has a moment, and then it's like, well, I guess we're moving on. <laughs> and honestly, that's war in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of – I mean, this movie does have some interesting kind of subplots because essentially it's pretty straightforward. They're just going from location to location, trying to help, mm-hmm. you know, get their plane repaired. Um, the other subplot, I guess, that's really prevalent is the the one between uh, Quinn Cannon and Wanaki. Um because we yes. learned that Wanaki, uh, well, Wanaki's not a pilot, but he no. is, uh, what is his official title? What uh, He is he's a tail gunner. He's a what, sorry? He's a tail gunner. Tail gunner. So he's not a pilot. And the reason for that is we find out that when he was in school, when he's in training, uh, he unintentionally caused basically another pilot in training to die. Like he caused an accident. Yeah. The other pilot died. And Quinn Cannon is the one who basically kicked him out and was like, you're never going to be a pilot, obviously. Not, not. Not now, not ever, and uh, but not, but not because he disliked Wanaki, but well, no, just because, because he it's caused like, another. He showed he, he's not competent at being a pilot. What's what I mean? He so caused another pilot to die. <laughs> like that's that's, yeah. that's, a, that's not just like oh, oh, I don't like this kid. He bothers me. Well, training accidents happen, obviously, <laughs> and that's and that's gonna happen, and it's sad, but it does happen sometimes. But if it's negligence, I mean, as long as it wasn't. Like well, that's the thing. As long as I mean, clearly he wasn't proven to be completely negligent because otherwise he'd be in he'd be in Leavenworth, he'd be in the stocks, <laughs> yeah, in the stockade. But um, um but that whole thing uh kind of comes together uh decently towards the end. Like that that that's one of those. Th- yeah. That's I think maybe the strongest part of the movie is that subplot yeah. because um I do like the way that so they don't like harp on it a lot. Like, they're not just constantly like, you'll never fly, kid. You're a loser. Like, nothing like that. Yeah, but yeah. later on, of course, when uh, Quinn Cannon's, uh, when the when the Mary Lou, what is it, Mary Lou? Mary Ann, Mar- I think. Mary Ann. When Mary Ann is, uh, is shot and, you know, uh, Quinn Cannon's going down and he's he's basically dying at that point, uh, Wanaki has to actually grab the controls and right the plane and land it. And, uh, you know, Quinn Cannon obviously dies anyway, but at least he, he gets the redemptive arc in that he got yeah. to save the plane, right? And then they later, of course, well, repair the plane. So that there's a little, there's a nice little wraparound for that, I guess. Well, and also, Wanaki as a character, you know, he comes in with a real chip on his shoulder and he's just like, yeah, I'm getting out of the army in three weeks yeah. and whatever. I just don't really want to be here. And, you know, and he obviously has a grudge against Quinn Cannon for what happened because he wanted to be a pilot so bad, but... He like he he learns to be a team player. He decides he wants to stay, and yeah, and then he has his heroic moment where he doesn't have to land the plane. The pilot, uh, Quinn Cannon, says, "Everybody get off! I'll, I'm gonna hold this thing steady while everybody gets off, right?" And everybody else bails out of the plane. Yeah. But when Aki stays and makes an attempt to land it on the runway and comes down without gear and manages to get it down without killing the two of them. Well, and his character also exists for a sort of propaganda trope too, because like you said, he starts at the movie basically being like, I'm getting out of the army. It's just not for me. I don't like it. I don't want to be in the air force. And throughout the course of the movie, he learns that being in the air force is pretty neat. <laughs> pretty cool after all. Yeah. Like that's just, it's very like, uh, you know, like in, in any other war movie, I feel like, uh, Private Chester would be the idiot that gets killed right away because he's like, whoa, this is going to be a fun yeah. war. This is going to be one of those crazy kooky wars I keep hearing about. And he would die right away, and Wanaki would be someone who would, like, be justified in everything he said. You know what I mean? So so in your head, Jack McBrayer is in every movie, every war movie. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Man, I well, wish. Well, golly gee, it's so happy to be here. Jack- I've never been outside of Georgia before. But as his character in 30 Rock. 
Yes, yeah, as Kenneth in uniform. As Kenneth in uniform, <laughs> in his page uniform, wearing a, a 1940s pilot hat. And Jason, I don't know, I, I was going to save this for later, but does the name Wanaki sound familiar to you at all? I know what you're going to say, Brendan, so I'll say no, it doesn't. Why, why should it? <laughs> well, Jason, I don't know if you're familiar with a little film called Pulp Fiction. Um, I have seen it. But there is a scene in which Christopher Walken uh, regales to young Butch, uh, Bruce Willis, a story about his uh, his watch that has been passed down through the family uh, through various assholes. And at one point he <laughs> mentions uh, a guy named Wanaki. And he yeah. also mentions, I think, Hawaii as well, which is yes. so like it's a direct reference to this movie, clearly. And of course, Quentin Tarantino has seen this. Um, but of course, that's it's an interesting thing. I didn't even think of it. And then it, and then when I listened and I heard Wanaki, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, that's the name he says in Pulp Fiction. Of course. Yes. Um, so Tarantino look into this for inspiration as well. Yeah, so they uh, so they end up in the Philippines, and is that where they they go into the plane gets shot up? And yeah, right, okay, right, right. So yeah, obviously, it's when the when the captain dies, the plane crashes down, and it's pretty wrecked, and they're just gonna burn it because they're gonna because they don't want the Japanese to get a hold of their bombers, so they're just gonna burn all the planes. Mm-hmm. And these guys decide that after they after a very uh, heartfelt scene of watching their captain die, uh, <laughs> they. Um, they decide they're going to make Marianne fly again. They're going to get this thing built. And the colonel at the base is like, are you crazy? <laughs> this thing won't fly again. we got to burn it. Well, and they send it, guys in to burn it. Yeah, and I think the whole thing is like, we only need a few days to do it. And they're like, the Japanese, they don't say the Japanese. I'm not going to say the word once during this whole episode. Sorry, <laughs> folks. But they go like, the Japanese are going to be here in like six hours. Or six hours. You, you need three days? And, you know, they hold them off and eventually rebuild the plane and everything. And... Which, by the way, that is one of the more awesome, like, intense scenes in that movie is them getting this, trying to get this plane ready to go, trying to get the engine. It's so, it's so tense. Mm -hmm. Trying to get the last engine to turn on as the Japanese are overrunning their position. Like, literally, the guys, the soldiers are, like, like 15 feet away shooting Japanese in the the wood line. Like, they are, they're right there. And they managed to get the damn thing off the ground and into the air. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there are there are moments like that where uh, genuinely tense. And I mean, I obviously have to point out the climactic uh, air fight as a highlight for Mm. sure, because, oh, yes, uh, I mean, you've got someone like Howard Hawks who did not slouch was no slouch and did not slack when it came to like you was, know shooting scenes like this like he he was was he not the fellow who made wings uh co-directed wings i don't know i don't do research or i'm thinking of another movie i i know he's done other air movies uh before like air war air war movies yeah he's done other errol flynn movies <laughs> Yeah, no, he did. Well, he did a lot of war movies, um, but he uh, he's not one to he's not one to sludge when it comes to the, these kinds of scenes. He also did, by the way, uh, uh, his girl Friday. Um, oh, OK. He's not but he's not one to sludge when, when it comes to these kinds of scenes. He He really does go for it. So. I mean, they would. They went to the base and shot all this stuff for you know days and days and days. Like all this, like fly, all these flying scenes. So a lot of it is like real planes flying through the air, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. the stuff that is miniatures. I mean, looks pretty good for 1943. Yeah, it 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 works pretty good. Like it's it's uh, it's really consistent looking. I think across it. Like yeah, yeah the odd time you'll see something you're like, okay, that's pretty clearly a miniature, but it's so well made. Like they they. They really put some effort into this, especially given the, the kind of compressed timetable they were on trying to get this thing out. Well, and Jason, I think what I like is I think I think what I like about the action about these sequences and I think what people could do more of in maybe modern films is uh, working within your limitations and knowing what your limitations are, like being like, well, maybe I shouldn't try to do this. Maybe what I can hmm. accomplish and, uh, you know up to the point of where I can make something look good, I, I should maybe only go this far. Like, there's no reason yeah. to try to shoot this and make it look like shit when I can shoot something almost as cool and make it yeah. look really good. One of the things I do not like generally about movies, and obviously there's exceptions to this. By the way, he I also directed a movie called gonna... I Was a Male War Bride. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> well, bam, maybe we should put that on the list. <laughs> um, like one of the things I really don't like 
in movies for the most part. And I'll say there there are probably exceptions because you know what? Some people know how to do cool shit like this. But I really hate when when the camera in a movie does a camera move that a camera is not possible of of actually doing. Okay. Like like um like Pearl Harbor is a good example where they drop the bomb from the plane. And the camera like kind of spins in behind the bomb and follows it down, and it's like I don't like that shit. I'd rather, I'd rather have it like look like somebody just dropped a camera that then followed alongside the bomb or something. Like I like using effects through grounded perception to make those effects sound f- seem more real. Yeah, and I think that's you know what more. I, mean? I think that's more Michael Bay than anything else doing that shit. Yeah. But I mean in that in that situation, yes, absolutely. But also like like you said about consistency, if the movie is fucking nuts the whole way through then sure mm. fine do your crazy camera shots yeah. but if you're trying to do something that's more grounded and more uh, <laughs> no pun intended and more like you know yeah. realistic or just true to life i guess i think it's better to yeah to have motivated camera camera moves for sure and also mm. this movie kind of stands out too in that it's a big propaganda war movie, but I feel like it's one of the few where when they're in the plane, you don't really hear a whole lot of music. You just kind of hear the whirring yeah. of the engines, the guys talking about nothing. You know, they're having meaningless conversations for the most part. And um, the, and, and it's more like a just, I guess it, may, it makes you feel more like you're there rather than just like, you know, the army marches yeah. on and we take down the Japanese. That's, that's of course, uh, <laughs> my favorite war song. Um, yeah, it was your favorite scene in Walk in the Sun, yes. Yes, it's, yes. Um, but Jason, I think we, we really can't avoid this whole thing here because, I mean, it was a 1943 film. It was certainly made to bolster mm-hmm. morale in, in American soldiers and, you know, the Air Force and all that stuff. It, it, it's it's kind of racist. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in, in so much as any propaganda film uh, against the Japanese was. I mean, I, I would say it's it's less racist maybe than some other films simply because, like uh, how we talk about Hacksaw Ridge, we really don't get much face time with the Japanese at all. I was... The, the racism is more in them being this unseen enemy in a lot of ways. Well, I was going to say, I was shocked. Shocked, I tell you that during the scenes where we actually see the Japanese people being attacked is that I'm pretty Mm -hmm. sure they were all Asian actors at the very least. Yeah. Because you think, yeah, I think they at least hired Asian actors to be in the scenes. Yes. Which which I mean, they very well could have not, you know, they could have, very well could have not. And I'm go ahead. I was going to say, I'm I'm sure those people given the climate at the time, were happy to have the work too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But I think the biggest thing that sticks out, and this is something I read about um, is not only that, you know, they call them words that we shouldn't use, people, mm-hmm. um, but there's also scenes where they're landing in Maui and they're shot at by, quote-unquote, local Japanese, and this is just a thing that just simply didn't happen. Yeah, that's it's uh, it was rumors at the time, and yeah, there was no partisans on the island. In fact, one of the uh, sergeants even talks about, like, oh, when the local Japanese ran a uh, turnip truck or something and broke the tails off three planes which Didn't none of happen. this happened this is and yeah. this is this is all part of the propaganda thing to be like oh you know they could attack from any angle but that's also mm. isn't that kind of what led to like the internment camps and stuff yes 100% which is it makes it for sure. an extra layer of uh, yeah you know yeah, and, and like the idea that, because, yeah, the, the, just the racist assumption that local people of Japanese descent were immediately going to turn on, on their friends on you know the, in Hawaii just because of this war. Yeah, exactly. So just because they were born in the same country, they would suddenly be like, of course, we hate America. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, or well, and a lot of them were second generation, like Japanese, like the Jap- Japanese-born parents who had moved to Hawaii and had kids there. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that, I mean... Uh, the fact that they had Asian people surprised me, but when I read that, I was like, oh, that's not, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> I don't know what the internment camp situation, but it's like, did they just hire people out of the internment camp? Oh, I really hope not. This movie came out in 1943. When did the internment camp start? Certainly, I must have shortly been after Pearl Harbor because, um, I mean, that was the, you know, kind of an instigating factor, was it not? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. For February 19th, 1942 to March 20th, yeah, 1946. 125,000 so. people in 75 yeah. 
different incarceration sites. Um, yeah, all bad, very bad. <laughs> Not a good thing at all. Um, this is a, a executive order 9066 was issued two months after Pearl Harbor. So there you go. And for the movie, yet- the movie to forward that notion of like, yeah, this is probably a good thing we're doing is uh, a little fucked up. <laughs> um, it's also funny that we get like, cause we've had opening crawls and closing crawls and some of the movies we talked about. And it's just so funny. Like platoon opens up with that, that quote, right. About young mm. man sacrificing yourself, blah, blah, blah. And this is like <laughs> the mo- most opposite you could possibly get. It's like the soldier yeah. marches on to battle. He's a happy well, man. <laughs> it's a, it's an Abraham Lincoln quote and it's underscored by mm-hmm. the battle hymn of the Republic. So they're really pulling on the patriotic heartstrings here yeah. with the Lincoln quote. I just think it's fun. It's funny to contrast these movies as we go. Um, to the very different t- times that they were being made, like the motivating factor behind making the movie. Um, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to see. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I uh, also, I want to talk, uh, we, we didn't mention it, but like, that final battle scene in the movie takes place when they spot a Japanese invasion fleet headed for Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yes, which is also another thing that did not happen. The Japanese were in no position to invade Australia after the Pearl Harbor attack. Well, they just weren't. They were busy with other stuff. They were attacking the Philippines and they were attacking elsewhere. Well, and I'm assuming they were terrified because Australia all all uh, prisoners. So and yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, assuming exactly. that's why they didn't invade. <laughs> I'm assuming they were afraid of getting shanked and uh, yes. <laughs> stab- stabbed in the but, shower but- in various places. But that, but that was a real fear for Australians that the Japanese were going to invade, you know, because they had invaded islands near Australia. I'm just kidding, Australia. You only used to be prisoners. Most of you are pretty cool. Look, Australia, you've gotten off way too easy on this oh, podcast. Wow. Think about the poor Irish, and we love the Irish, but think about all the shit we've given the Irish. No, uh, you haven't got you haven't got but nothing compared. And to now that. I want to correct you. Think about all the shit Jason has given the Irish. Thank you. Continue. Nope, we're in this together, Brendan. It's uh, our bigotry is um, communal. Jason's opinions do not necessarily reflect those of mine. <laughs> um, For screening country, Irish people keep drinking. Oh, That's what we say. Oh dear God, <laughs> Jason. I'll tell you what I think was interesting too is the cho- um, the film cho- filming choice because I I I said to myself, well, maybe that's a budget reason, but I don't think so because there are these fights in the sky that look like they were incredible, you know, they, they were hard to film at the time and they certainly look like, certainly looks like a lot of money was put into it, but it's an interesting idea to that. They only experienced the Pearl Harbor attack really over the radio. Like they're only hearing, mm-hmm. you know, you know, they hear the Japanese people on the radio. They hear uh, the news announcement. They hear the, the sounds outside, like kind of far away, but they hear them. And yep. it's it's just interesting because going into this, I said, okay, this is a movie taking place after Pearl Harbor, was made shortly after Pearl Harbor. Surely they're going to show something from that attack, but they don't. Um, and I also wonder if maybe they thought it's too soon to show that. Yeah, also, I think recreating the Pearl Harbor attack in any capacity would be probably more money than they were willing to spend at that point. But they don't show anything, though. That's the thing. Like, you see that shot from, like, way up. But, I mean, it is surprising to me that they didn't even, like, show a miniature plane going into a boat or whatever. You know, like, nothing like that. Yeah. And and I I, I do think, sure, budgetary-wise, but, I mean, Howard Hawks was a... a, You hmm. worked with a lot of big budgets, but I think... I, I do think that the part of the reason was because it was so fresh in people's heads and they didn't want to like, I don't know, they didn't want to like uh, bring back the trauma. So traumatize them. Yeah, yeah. It's like when those. It's like um, when that asshole made that Titanic movie in like 1923 and like cast one of the survivors. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, just to re-traumatize them after the fact. So, Brent, I would make an artistic argument for that choice. I think, and I think it was a choice uh, uh, beyond just budgetary. I think because for most people who were learning about Pearl Harbor as it was happening, that's how they were hearing it. They were hearing snippets over the radio, chatter, Japanese radio signals coming in like that. It was just chaos, right? They didn't know what was going on. They knew something was happening, Mm -hmm. but they didn't know what. And I think that's just the pilots are representing those people like the rest of us who do are hearing about it, you know, in fragments. 
and then they show up after the fact and it's just a wreck. It's just they don't know exactly what happened. They just know the Japanese attacked the place and it's fucked. They don't even know the extent of the damage at that point. Like they don't they don't re- I guess they don't realize that they lost most of the Pacific fleet in that attack. Yeah, I mean that's true. I mean does f- I mean footage doesn't exist of the actual Pearl Harbor attack, I'm assuming. That's a really good question. I don't know if anybody had the foresight to... I mean, there's definitely images of, like, the battleships burning in the harbor. Sure. Like, I don't know if the attack was over or not, but there are shots of, like, the damage that was caused by it, but I don't know about the actual attack itself. Sure. Well, I don't... I mean, I don't think... Anybody, I mean, to run a film camera back then, you that takes a mm. lot of commitment, right? You can't, Absolutely. People didn't just have them well, on their phones and turn around and start filming. One movie that we don't have on the list, and I suggest that we don't have it on the list simply because it's kind of boring, but uh, in Tora Tora Tora, they do a, they, they, I think they recreate Pearl Harbor to some extent, and obviously doing it with 70s era technology, but, uh, and it's not bad. I do like the Michael, B, the Michael Bay Pearl Harbor attack in a lot of ways, but it's the only good part of that I movie. was going to say, it's a it's a 45 minute, uh, uh, you know, selection of scenes, and it's, far and away the best part of that movie and that's not that mm-hmm. i'm like you know oh you can't have romance like you can have romance but it's just not a very good romance see our entire episode we did about this like five years ago on what were they thinking yeah find it it's near the beginning low haiku <laughs> um yeah and the other thing too so it's so yeah so i thought that was really interesting um we talked about the the effects and the look of the attacks and everything but i think what's cool is when they're on the ground um the air the the land battles because there's some there's some land battles and hawks does this thing where like the camera shakes a little bit like he blurs it a little bit and there's also like yeah there's like a shake too and and i think that speaks to the cinematography which i think honestly is the strongest part about this movie is the is the look of it um but like like i said even the even the ground stuff i was kind of surprised with how he he took 1943 technology and made that uh, made that real kind of reminded me like to a lesser extent obviously but it reminded me a little bit of of when they did that in all quiet on the western front right like they clearly didn't have the technology to go as far as they would have wanted to go but they were at least able to make it look um to make it look real in some way absolutely Sometimes, sometimes, uh, you, if you want to blow up a church, you just got to blow up a fucking church. There's a, there's a weird, there's a weird subplot that I don't really think resolves itself. I mean, it does, but not really well. Um, the character McMaster has a sister, and we find out she was, uh, she was, she's in the hospital because she's in the car with some other guy, Radar. When the Japanese, I think if this is one of the, those times they said the Japanese Americans were shooting at them. And uh, she ends up in the hospital and he ends up fine. And then, you know, they, they have some, he has some, McMaster has some resentment towards Radar because he blames him for being in the car with his sister when it happened and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, and Williams clearly is sweet on, on her and right. is trying to date her and he's not happy about it either. Right. Or hanging out with this other guy. But, and then it's resol- it's resolved later. Like I thought, I mean, I assumed she would die because she's in the hospital and she's like, oh boys, I'm so glad you came to visit me. And I'm like, oh, this is a sure sign of 1943 <laughs> death. But later he gets a telegram and it's like, she's fine. She's going into surgery. Everything's great. And they never come back to that. And I thought that was weird. <laughs> right? Like I, I would think that, um, and then, and then the character Radar just exists, I'm assuming, to criticize emerging uh, military technology. Because there's that whole there's that whole scene where they're pointing out how everything's getting more automated and easier to use. And he's like, I don't know about this new technology, <laughs> hoo-ha. Yeah, there's always that guy. <laughs> is the movie taking his side, though? Or is the movie taking the side of everyone else being like, you're a silly boy? I mean, I, I, I don't know that it intentionally takes a side, but I think the war would prove that the technology was the side that, that won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out because like he, do, he does, he's like, give me three minutes and I'll explain to you. And he's talking about how, like, you know, technology is going to take over. It's actually kind of prescient if you think about it because. Well, he, he did predict drones. It, it, so. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah, these robo robo pilots, you see, and they'll be flying under you. <laughs> I mean, just in general, he's predicting like you know, technology might not be so great in some ways as it takes over. Yeah. Very prescient. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, Heat Radar is talking about AI, folks. 
folks, it's not good. AI, it's taken over our lives. Don't fall prey to AI. Uh, we also didn't mention uh, uh, Monkhouse, the navigator, who is got his own little uh, uh, little thing going on where his dad was a famous World War I fighter ace who I I think it was pretty clear he got killed at some point. He did. But he's like a, he's like a, a beloved hero. Mm-hmm. And he's well known. And his son, like, like Wanaki, was not able to live up to him as a pilot. So uh, he became a navigator. And he's kind of dealing with his own mind, trying to live up to his father's legacy. But, you know, he's not his father. He's mm-hmm. his own man. But that doesn't really go very far. Like, it, there's a couple scenes with him, but it doesn't really resolve in any meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like I said, a lot of the subplots are kind of whatever. But, um, I, like I said, I think the only one that really resonated, at least for me, was the Quinn Cannon and Wanaki thing. And I think the main reason yeah. for that, Jason, is because I think John Garfield as Wanaki is head and shoulders the best performance in this movie. Like, by yeah. a, a country mile. Um, because uh, I don't know. I really like that uh, Buddy Hackett looking motherfucker uh, who plays uh, Weinberg. Or, <laughs> okay. uh, is that his name? Weinberg, the engineer or the the gunner guy, the guy that wears the hat. Uh, you know what I mean? Fat guy. Weinberg. He's from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're name? talking about. Is it the guy? It's not, but it's not the guy from A Walk in the Sun who speaks Italian and Brooklyn, right? No, <laughs> not the same guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he has one of those great moments where he runs into somebody from Brooklyn and they have, they, then they're very Brooklyn to each other. Well, I mean, it, it, that does kind of remind me of A Walk in the Sun when that dude runs into uh, the Italians and they're talking to each other. Yes, exactly. It's a similar a similar uh, vibe for sure. I don't know. I think, but there's something about like I, I don't say anyone's like bad, but to me, John Garfield is like it. It seems like a modern acting performance, like because hmm. this is a guy that's like very much was in the same school as like Marlon Brando and James Dean. That he was a method actor, uh, one of the one of the earlier kind of method actors, and you could tell hmm. like he's he's doing a different kind of performance. Like he's, he's a little quieter. He's more somber. He's taking his time with his dialogue. He's not like, well, boys, we're going to head up there. We're going to bomb the Japanese. That's yeah. what I got to do. Like he's, it's a very different kind of performance yeah. for, for, especially for the time. It really is. And I wonder if that's maybe why for, at least for me, that, particular plot line resonates the most i think that so one seems like the most genuine yeah i think so i think because he plays emotion very well and i will say that uh john ridgely as quinn cannon is is pretty good too um it, he is good that that death scene is is i think well acted it's also on one hand it's kind of cringy yeah but on the other hand it is really sweet like like he's basically going through the process of flying the plane and they're all standing there just going along with it and responding to him as they would respond to him in the plane and then he dies like as they take off. Well, Jason, speaking of cringy, I'm just going to out and say it. Um, this isn't my favorite one we've watched so far. <laughs> this, mm. I, I do think I, I mean, we talked about highlights and there's a lot of things I said that I liked, but um, it's kind of outweighed by a lot of the character stuff that I don't think really works. I think a lot of it is very kind of held down by some of the, I don't know. I don't know how to put it. it it's kind of held down by the, the, the the very generic other stuff by by the needs of propaganda i, I mean that does that hurts it for sure that hurts but i mean that's what it is right it is yeah. a film that is meant to be a a a morale booster um a, a, a generally appealing sort of film it doesn't really have the opportunity to go into those things although it would be interesting to you because this bomber like it allows for that dynamic that is the similar dynamic you get in something like star trek where you have a bunch of people serving on the same vessel together and they have these adventures together and it allows them this character development between you know with their relationships with each other and and the things they encounter and whatnot i mean i know this isn't a tv show but Mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of dramatic possibility sorry there's a lot of dramatic possibility in a bomber is what i would it was what i'm saying yeah i mean you wear that t-shirt proudly (laughs) <laughs> Every day, a lot of dramatic, a lot of dramatic possibility in a. You bar. get a lot of looks from people. Um, yeah, people don't understand it not, at all. Not trusting looks. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it feels like to me like Howard Hawks was like, I'm all about filming these crazy, you know, air air attack scenes and combat scenes and all that, where everything else kind of takes a backseat a little bit. Um, but he, but he tries. I, it's a weird, it's a weird dynamic. I don't know. It's just, it's a, it. Like you said, maybe it's the propaganda of it all that's kind of weighing it down for me. But it just um, 
it doesn't fully come together. It, it's I will say I liked it more than American Sniper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the uh, what's the point of the dog? That's a good question. Uh, the Dam Busters hadn't happened yet, and they didn't realize that you were supposed to give the dog a racist slur as a name. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this dog's name was was better. <laughs> Well, Tripoli, yeah, Tripoli, Tripoli is a good than, the other, than the other dog, and also, but but this dog, they are training to be racist, so maybe yeah, he's been yeah, he's well, but we never see him bark at a Japanese person. He barks whenever he hears Mr. Him, Moto. He hears Mr. Moto's name mentioned, and and they do <laughs> ask him, "What do you think of the Japanese?" And he barks, rough. Because yeah. I don't know if you know this, Jason. Every time a dog barks, it is the most aggressive thing they could possibly be doing. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, well, they take him into their plane. Like that would never happen, right? Like they take the dog. So the, there's a there's a fleet of people that are like, we're about to get like blasted. We're we're about to get destroyed here. Save this little doggy, and they bring him to like another yeah. uh, another yeah. army for safety. I guess. You know what? I 100 percent believe that that could happen. That that I mean, especially in a war situation, especially like they've just witnessed like a massive attack on American soil. They are at war. They know this. They know things are not going to be good. And when you're in that state of mind, maybe uh, you know things in the world, maybe regulations take less immediate interest to you. And you see a dog that could very well die in the Japanese attack that's coming and you want to take him with you. I mean, as long as you know, I, I don't want to have to clean up his shit. Where are you going to put it? You can't just dump it out the window. Oh, listen, listen. I get it. Like, I get it. I would also save the dog and transport the dog. Yes, but of course. I just, I was I was surprised. I'm wondering, though, if it's, like, a thing that was used to, like, soften the characters a little bit. To, like, get, like... Maybe. They're all just a, they're all just a couple, a bunch of big lugs with hearts of gold. Look at the way yeah. they take care of the puppy. Weinberg's a softie. Just because he's a Jew doesn't mean he's a demon. He likes dogs. Wow. <laughs> I don't know that that's what the movie's saying. Well, I mean, that would be the time to say it. <laughs> no, Hollywood wasn't. That working. was the war to say that, hey, Jews aren't demons, guys. Hollywood wasn't working for Hitler at the time, Jason. That relationship had ended at this point. Um, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, the other thing, I, the, the I guess the kind of the last thing I wanted to ask you anyway, to you, Jason, Mr. Mm. War Expert. Hit me. Um, at the end of the movie, they say that they're going to Tokyo. What mission is that? Is that the one where they drop the bomb? No, uh, I I was wondering the same thing, Brendan, okay. and I think uh, based on the rest of this movie's inaccuracies that it just wasn't a thing. Now, after Pearl Harbor, if we remember from the film Pearl Harbor, yes. directed by Michael Bay, uh, starring Ben uh, Alec Affleck. Baldwin, uh, yes, starring Ben Affleck, Alec Baldwin takes uh, Ben Affleck and a few others on a run uh, to Tokyo to drop some bombs on them. That was called the Doolittle Raid, mm-hmm. and... It's possible that they could have been going on the Doolittle Raid, but the Doolittle Raid was a, like, one-way trip. Right. In a lot of ways, because they had to d- ditch, they d- only had enough fuel to get there. So their plan, they ended up ditching their planes over the Sea of uh, Japan and were trying to get to China. And I don't know, I think some of them got captured and some of them ended up getting to the Chinese, but it was meant to basically just scare the Japanese, to, to say, like, hey, we can hit your city. Yeah, and that's, of course, the uh, famous scene in Pearl Harbor where Alec Baldwin is like, this is their bomb. I'm going to give it back to them. <laughs> Classic uh, moment Let's in cinema. Let's finish the fight. Yeah. That, did that win Oscars cheer moment that year? Yes. It was it was voted online uh, on AOL.com. I mean, listen, we're never going to get it uh, to, the, to the high point we got when the Flash entered the Speed Force. I mean, how can you? I mean, you? I... Everybody remembers where they were when the Flash entered the speed. I was cheer- I was cheering in uh, the theater, but I was watching Book Club. But I knew it was going on in two theaters over, and I cheered because I could just hear the faintest sound of it because uh, Justice League was a very loud movie. <laughs> and I, I, you know what, Brendan? Yeah. I was sleeping in bed, yeah. and all of a sudden, I woke up and I was just bawling my eyes yeah. out, and I didn't know why. I just, I just, I just felt all these emotions, and I didn't know why. And it turns out, Flash entered the speed force. Wow! At that very moment. At that exact moment. Was it the moment they filmed it or the moment it aired in a movie theater? Brendan, it was the moment it happened. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. About that. Wow. Fuck. Wow. Fuck. Wow. Fuck. Wow. I like how they immediately dropped that idea after the one time they did it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the Oscar hey, cheer hey, moment going to be this year? No, we're not doing it. <laughs> They, they Look, they picked the best moment in cinema history. They did. So where can they go up from here? How can you follow that? How can you follow the Flash entering the Speed Force? What? It, the only thing I could possibly think of is something that happens in the Flash. I mean, I'm assuming he enters the Speed yeah, Force uh, again. I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe when, when Bat- uh, Michael Keaton shows up and says, I'm Batman. Yeah. It'll probably be um, when the Flash uh, slows everything down and does that, uh, does that scene that's uh, already been ripped off from X Men, where everything's in slow motion, but he's in regular motion and he moves things around, yes. and it's super funny. Yeah, because it hasn't already been done in a much better movie. Um, <laughs> I'm, little... I'm really excited for the scene where he starts grooming a 16 year old oh. girl and then like uh, uh, starts living with her parents in the country. Oh dear, that was God. a weird subplot. Uh, what... I'm surprised they kept it. I- I'm I'm alarmed that they thought that that would make him still likable. Um, <laughs> over the film, just want to make him relatable. Relatable to Ezra Miller and Ezra Miller alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason, uh, do you have any other big things you want to talk about before we take our little breaky? Uh, we'll get it in the notes. I, I wanted to, when we were talking about the music, I would say if there was music in this movie besides the battle hymn and the Republic at the beginning, it made no impact on me because I don't remember. I don't think there was because I think when they're on the plane, mm. which is a lot of the movie, um, it's yeah. just the sounds of the plane. I think even when they're on the yes. islands uh, talking to the other troops, it's it, there's no music there either. By the way, before we get to this, we got to say one more inaccuracy i got to point out. If they were on that plane that whole time, that plane was too quiet. That plane should have been like, in the background the whole time, and everybody should have been shouting the whole movie. So what you're saying is you want uh, every character to be David Lynch's character in Twin Peaks. Yes. Absolutely. Just screaming the whole time. We're going to bomb the island. Or David Lynch in uh, David Lynch in Dune uh, as the as the, the spice miner. Sure. We, we got spice. We got we got worm sign. It's weird that David Lynch played a 14 year old in that movie. <laughs> Didn't you say he was a miner from the planet spice? But boom. boom. Ah. Brendan's here all week, folks. I am. But we are going to be gone for a few minutes because we are going to take a brief break. And uh, we will be right back. Hey, fella, do you like flying in the sky? Well, you should check out the U.S. Army Air Forces. Learn more at ageofradio.org. Coming in for a landing. We're coming in for a landing. We're heading for the runway. And we're heading to Spitz and Bobs, because we're going to fly into the Bits and Bobs. Fly into the Bits and Bobs, where Jason and Brandon have abandoned my original idea, and I just went with Danger Zone. Nah, Bits and Bobs. Thank you, Brendan. You're welcome. The first inaccuracy, uh, another inaccuracy I need to point out right out of the gate, this movie's called Air Force. Now, that in of itself is not an inaccuracy. However, this movie is not about the United States Air Force because the United States Air Force did not exist until after World War II. This movie deals with the United States Army Air Forces, oh. which was the air component of the, uh, basically all air stuff at the time was done through the Army. When you said so, that it didn't exist until after World War II, and this is an in- inaccuracy, I was like, were they Time Lords? <laughs> <laughs> no, the um the, the the original the Army Air Service or whatever was under was under the army in World War One mm-hmm. and then it stayed under the army until after the war and they decided it was time to you know set up a dedicated service to uh, air warfare. I want to point out two weird moments at the beginning. So at the beginning we never really we didn't really talk about much of the much about this, but this is when all the guys are just kind of meeting each other. Some of them know each mm. other. Chester shows up and he's like, Gee shucks, saw Willikers and all that stuff. Um, we get, when we get little snippets of like the, the kind of subplots that we're going to get, um, one of the scenes that disturbed me to my core was, um, uh, one of the guys is visited by his girlfriend and she says like, um, you know, uh, here's a hug from me and your brother sent you this. And then she gives him like the most passionate kiss in the world. <laughs> and I'm like, your brother sent you a passionate, like Frencher? Like I thought that was weird, and then the other. Hey, and if you see your boyfriend, stick your stick your tongue down his throat and tell him it's from me. <laughs> well, if you see my brother, that's what it is. Yeah, I guess so. If you see my brother, <laughs> stick your tongue down his throat and tell him it's from me. Um, the other thing that's um, I thought the kiss between Chester and his mother was a little too Norman Bates for me. Yeah, I, yeah. It was, I mean, do we need to bring mom into this? Mom wants to meet his 
captain. Oh, come it was on. very come on. well. No, but it was very on the mouth and for yeah. too long. <laughs> Well, she's going to miss him. I just like, I was like waiting for the part where he snapped in the plane. He's like, mother always said I should be a pilot. I could fly this plane. <laughs> and then he just like dive bombs into the, into the ground. <laughs> Chester at one point says, ah, Christmas crackers. And that made me laugh a lot. <laughs> he's like, who is this fucking butter starch? He's just like, <laughs> oh, it, Christmas crackers, it's, li- it's literally a Disney character in this movie. It's it, <laughs> this guy. This guy thinks he's showing up to Operation Dumbo Drop. He's like straight from Central Casting War movie for sure. <laughs> yeah, this guy. Um, let's see. Did you notice, Brendan, that uh, uh, there was of of, all, of the few ladies that appeared in this movie, only the sister gets a credit? Oh, I did not notice. There's a lot of uncredited people in this movie, though. Yeah, yeah, there is. They just don't want to pay no one. Can I ask you a question? Because remember we talked about last week how there was an uncredited role. We were trying to see. I don't know if this was on air, if this was just us talking. But th- we, yeah. we were trying to see if there was any actual um, Asian names in the cast. And I think yes. we saw that two characters were old Chinese man and Chinese boy. Who were they? Yes. I didn't notice that. That was a platoon, I think, was it? Or w- No, this was this movie. No, that was Dumbo Drop. That was Dumbo Drop, wasn't it? No, this was this movie. No. Oh, it was this movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right. I didn't see a Chinese old man or a Chinese boy in this movie, unless they were cut from the final from the final. Uh, maybe movie. or maybe it was a very brief shot, perhaps. Because I remember when we saw that, you were like, "Wait, the only two Asian people in this movie about Pearl Harbor are Chinese?" <laughs> yeah. So I thought that weird, but then again, then again, you do see um, what, I, I I believe a bunch of Asian actors playing the Japanese who are definitely not credited, but they're yeah, basically they're, extras. They're, they're, I mean, honestly. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they don't have any. I mean, they actually they do speak some lines, but it's in Japanese or allegedly Japanese. I can't say for sure. I think it's Japanese. You know what, though? I will give them even if it's not Japanese, which I feel like it might not be. I feel like it might just be gibberish. Maybe I'm just going based on what I know about this year in Hollywood. But even if it isn't, um, I like that they at least didn't just have them speaking English. Yeah. In in heavily accented voices. Hmm. Just Mickey Rooney, just CGI'd all over the place. This movie has has one of the great grandfather jokes because I imagine because this this feels like something my grandfather would have done to me. Where they say to he's like, he says, "Look, do you know where we're going?" He says to the the the, uh, the sergeant says to the captain, "Do you know where we're actually going?" And he says, "Sergeant, can you keep a secret?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Good," and then walks away. Yeah, they repeat that. <laughs> they repeat that a few times. Yeah, well, because then, then the then the crew chief, the sergeant crew chief, repeats it to one of the younger guys who asks him the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I thought you were going to say that he asked him, uh, do you know where we're going? And he responded with, I know where we're going and I know how <laughs> to get there. Callback. Callback. Um, the pilot, uh, Pontius. A, a Quinn cannon. What? Uh, Pontius pilot. Yes. Pontius pilot. Yeah. Washes his hands in the sink <laughs> on the plane. Um, he has a, the pilot has a trinket that his son made for him, which I guess is his good luck trinket. And we see that a couple of times and then it's never referred to again. Well, what good luck was it? He died. I know. Exactly. It didn't work. They, they should have, they should have showed it like burning in a, in a, in a, like, like, a, or no, it would have got shot up in the air mm-hmm. before he died. And then he died. And then it was that that killed him. I, I <laughs> yes, I wrote down, um, at this point and I know it's a propaganda movie, so whatever, but I wrote down, like, I don't think one to one and a half years really gives you proper perspective on a historical event enough to make a movie about no. it. No. And, and clearly they decided, well, we don't clearly don't have enough perspective uh, or information, so we'll just take some basic building blocks and build our own story, which is kind of what Hollywood still does. We'll just make up our true own. stories. Um, I don't know yeah, about that, we'll just, Jason. We'll fill in our blanks. Jason, I don't know about that. I feel like any true story <laughs> these days is heavily researched. And yeah. I mean, I'm just real. I just really feel really bad for the kids uh, from Hostel. I think they went through a lot. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't think we should make light of that. No, we should Stop not. Stop making faces, Jason. <laughs> You'll never know, listener. Um, so they, they, so when they get attacked by the Japanese uh, partisans that never existed on the ground, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, I, I wrote a, I, in my notes I describe him as Mister Warmth because I didn't know his name, uh, Winaki. Mm. Uh, Winaki, he, he pulls his gun out and he starts firing his gun like he's a cowboy. He's just like he's like firing it from the hip, boom, 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 and the. Uh, uh, 
you know, uh, the crew chief, because he's like, get on the plane, and he, like, slaps him and knocks him out and then drags his ass onto the plane. Okay, I wrote that down because I, I was confused when I saw that because I must have looked away and looked back up, and I was like, wait, what? Why did he just slap his own man? <laughs> because when Aki wouldn't get on the yeah, plane, yeah. I think was the implication that he had, like, some sort of a death wish, and he wanted to just shoot at the Japanese, but the crew chief dragged him on the plane. He's like, you're not getting out of this this easy. I mean, I think we touched on this, but there's some pretty uh, nasty descriptions of Japanese soldiers. Not only just the words that they use, but they're also like, oh, they'll attack you. They'll attack one person with 20 and they're cowards and all this stuff. The Japanese were many things, but they were not cowards. Mm. But you know what I mean? Like that, that's, how, that's how the movie yeah. is treating it. Yeah. I mean, again, propaganda movie, the enemy mm-hmm. for sure. But also, I think it does a disservice to the troops that ended up having to go fight the Japanese if they saw this movie and thought that that was what they were in for. Oh, man. <laughs> you were not prepared. Yeah. The main character dies uh, with I... 36 minutes left to go. I would, I, I mean, I thought uh, Ridgely was the main character, like the pilot. He mm. seemed to me, yeah. he seemed to me to be like, you know, when, uh, when Josh Hartnett dies in uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you pronounce it, right? Hartnet. Hartnet. Yeah, it's um and yeah, that's a brave move in a propaganda film to kill a character, but he gets a heroic death. They do they it's kill, pretty bloodless they, death. They kill a few of them, which I was kind of surprised yeah. at in this kind of movie. But they're all heroes. So, right. you know, it's it's fine. It's fine. They die for their country and for their families. Jason, there's, um, there's a moment that kind of reminded me of Star Wars a little bit. Um, when they're firing, yes. when they're firing their guns from the ship, like they're they're at the their gunners or whatever are firing. Um, mm-hmm. one of them says like, uh, "I got him," and the other one's like, "Good work, don't talk, shoot." And it reminded me so much of that moment yeah. where Han Solo basically I, tells Luke, uh, "Great, yeah. now don't get cocky." Yeah, don't get cocky, kid. I mean, there, there's no question in my mind that George Lucas saw this movie and that's where he pulled it from. Yeah, in the same way that he saw Dan Busters and pulled a lot for the Death Star run on that. Uh, from that movie. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one that noticed that. Yeah, no, that's there's no way it's not. I mean, the, sh- the some of the shots are almost exact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I appreciate as, as I do whenever there's like a, a Pearl Harbor movie or, a, or an early war U.S. movie. So later in the war, I'm not exactly sure when, but the U.S. introduced the M1 combat helmet, which is the helmet you see in like Saving Private Ryan. It's kind of the classic U.S. World War II helmet. But the M1 had not been introduced at the beginning of the war. So everybody in this movie is appropriately wearing the old Doughboy style helmets, like the British style helmets. From the podcast, the Doughboys? So, yes, from the Doughboys, the wearing helmets, the themed helmets of their own. They should, they really should get Doughboy helmets. I'd buy a Doughboy, <laughs> Doughboy helmet. Jason, you know what I just thought of too? We mentioned it's uh, kind of like Star Wars. Also another similarity to Star Wars, uh, and certainly maybe not the first one, but certainly some Star Wars films, questionable representation of other races. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> See, the entire opening scene from Phantom Menace. Yeah. Yeah, they dropped that pretty quick. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh yeah, at one point, I think it's uh, the 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 Green Gunner guy jumps out of uh, the plane and he bails out, and uh, he gets shot down by the Japanese pilots, and that is a huge no no in pilot circles. Um, I don't know, maybe, again, maybe this was the, the Japanese weren't on the same cultural page as Europeans were, but like in the Europe, it was considered real bad form to shoot pilots. You didn't do it. Okay. Uh, that were that were parachuting down because you wanted the same consideration. Oh, you know, they it, <laughs> that if you bailed, you wouldn't get shot down either. Jason, there's a good chance it didn't happen, and they just did that to like make it's them possible. more of an enemy. Yeah, but but the Japanese were fought a type of war that was very intense and there's a good chance they did shoot down pilots. And this is I mean, I and and don't get me wrong, there were absolutely allied pilots that shot down enemy pilots mm-hmm. uh, that bailed out. There it d- does not I do not doubt it one bit. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that in general that was considered like the honorable thing was not to shoot down a pilot who had been bailed out. Jason, you know what I just realized uh, for some reason because we're mentioning pilots, I don't think Dunkirk is on this list. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. I think we're gonna have to talk about that one. We'll probably will. It's a it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, I like the line that uh, uh, I think somebody says to Weinberg. He says, "Why don't you fell asleep while you can?" And he goes, uh, "We kind of got out of the habit. <laughs> we're just yeah, we don't we don't we don't really sleep anymore. It's not something we do." Mm-hmm. Uh, and the last note I have is what an impressive battle sequence. 
because it was that final battle sequence against the fleet. Um, just impressive model work, impressive like actual plane footage, and then kind of and then cutting in the the actual gun cam footage and stuff from like from actual combat to make up for some of the stuff in the scenes. And yeah, it all, it works really well. It's intense. It's exciting. Um, so man, if nothing else, check that out. Yeah. I don't anything else from you, Brendan. No, I have no other notes, uh, uh, no other bits and bobs, but I will say that, um, Howard Hawks, uh, did credit the concept of the film to Lieutenant General Henry Arnold, um, which was loosely based on an actual flight of uh, some B-17s that left California on the night of December 6, 1941, and uh, literally flew into the war the next morning at Pearl Harbor. Like you said, they did try to release this movie on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, but they ran into many delays um, and uh, issues. I guess Howard Hawks was a bit of a perfectionist. Um, they did uh, film battle sequences in May and June of 1942 before they even finished the script and the storyline. Um, they also needed to, uh, they, they also couldn't really start the production until the War Department approved the script, which also took some time. Um, they, uh, the script itself was 207 pages long originally. Um, with with its first 55 pages devoted to character development, as you can see in this movie, that is <laughs> cut down substantially um god it would have turned into damn busters if they had done that <laughs> a lot of the aerial stuff they shot actually in florida and the reason for for that was um they were scared that people seeing japanese bombers in the sky that soon after pearl harbor would send people into a panic and they they shot stuff in texas too um just out, yeah. start try, try to get away from that area of the world <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was far less likely that actual Japanese bombers would be over Florida than maybe, say, over California. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, other than that, uh, the U.S. Army uh, U.S. Army Air Forces provided all of the aircraft that appear in the film. So, in total, I believe there is about uh, 20 different planes that they provided. Um, you talked about some of the uh, the inaccuracies, of which there are quite a few. So, I won't go over that anymore. I, I won't go over that again, but... Um, also, the other thing, too, is when they were flying the plane, uh, all the air crews wore throat mics, they're called. Yes. And basically, yes. Um, these these are p- picking up the sounds directly from their larynx because the planes are so goddamn loud. Like, we don't hear it mm-hmm. because they've uh, yep. mixed the audio. But when they're recording, the, the planes are actually so loud that they cannot hear each other speak. So you'll notice that whenever a crew member speaks, he puts his hand up against the mic and presses it against his throat. And this basically yeah. ensured that they they picked up the sound for the movie. Some high tech shit in in World War Two. I mean, I mean, throat mics are still around to this day, and they always seemed kind of like more futuristic to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that they were around back then. Back in nineteen forty three. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, this movie did receive some critical acclaim. Um, you know, it's uh, it did echo uh, a distrust of Japanese Americans, unfortunately, at the time, which was uh, prevalent in 1943. Uh, Bosley Crother of the New York Times characterized the film as continuously fascinating, frequently thrilling, and occasionally exalting. Although a lot of people dismissed it in modern times as a piece of wartime propaganda, um, it's still somewhat of a historical document, so it's got that uh, it's got that you know air of importance to it. And uh, a lot of reviews said, you know, Air Force is a model of fresh, energetic studio era filmmaking because it, it's a Howard Hawks movie, and it does feel different than a lot of the other movies at the time. Certainly, some of the cheaper ones. Um, yeah. Jason, this does go to the Oscars. I'll get you to mm. I'll get you to tell me the three. O- it's it's up for four. It wins one. Which three do you think it's nominated for and does not win? Uh, best special effects, yep. best sound, uh, best special best effects, director, best special effects that year goes to Crash Dive. Okay. Um, best sound? No, the other two are best original screenplay. That goes to, of course, Princess O'Rourke, which I think okay. uh, original screenplay. That's an odd one to be nominated for for this movie, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, and best black and white cinematography, and that of course goes to the Song of Bernadette. Um, but the movie does win, and I think this is a I think this is a pretty well deserved one. It wins best editing, so there you yeah, go. Yeah, okay. 
Um, no BAFTAs because they don't exist yet. Uh, movie cost $2.7 million, And again, I don't know how accurate these numbers are, but it says it made about $4.1 million at the box office. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that means it did quite well. <laughs> Uh, but other than that, that's, that's pretty much all I got for this movie. So Jason, I know we talked about it. We discussed it, but tell me deep within your soul, within your heart, what you thought of the, of the, of the air force of 1943. This is a good example of an old fashioned yarn of a war movie. It's a, uh, it's an, I, I think it's pretty entertaining. Uh, I like the actors in it. Um, it's not too deep, obviously. I mean, being a propaganda film, but it's got enough interesting kind of action sequences, um, and an interesting plot to follow. You know, I, I, I liked it. Um, I don't think it's uh, I don't I don't know that it necessarily even should be on the top 100 list of all time. But I mean, it's a solid uh, product of the war, you know, as far as a movie goes. And it's worth watching. But I mean, we even already we've seen some stone cold classics and this just does not hang. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is um, this is a movie that I think is I like I said, I've got issues with it, but it's it's fine like it's it's certainly technically um it's impressive um and howard hawks will come up again on this list so maybe there'll be something else that he makes that we'll think is a is a better uh, representation of him for for this list but let me tell you folks if somebody says to you hey you like war movies you should watch the damn busters punch them in the throat tell them to go fuck themselves and then go watch this movie because this is a better experience than the damn busters Jason, not a fan of the Dam Busters. I mean, but but again, watch the end of the Dam Busters. It's fantastic and it's important and it's and it's really well made. But just such a boring fucking movie. Um, I think I like the Dam Busters about uh, a little tiny bit better than this, but or maybe on the same level, okay. maybe close. But All right. I I just I do think this movie is too long. Um, it does kind of mm. meander a little bit, but. Um, yeah, yeah no, it, like it's fine. It's it is what it is. Like you said, it's a very old fashioned, very propaganda wartime movie. And uh, while the acting is not uh, tremendous, there's a few few bright spots. Uh, no, most most importantly, John Garfield. Uh, but that's it. Air Force done. We'll we'll read your comments next week if anyone in the world has seen this movie <laughs> that's still alive. Um, we, yeah. we will address <laughs> you. Um, but that's it for now. Now, Jason, next week we are going to get a little bit more modern. Actually, we're going to get a lot more modern. Um, oh. We are going to go forward all the way to the year 2009. This movie is released in 2009. We're going to talk about the film Lebanon. All right. I know that's a country, but I don't know anything about it as a movie. It is a, it is a country that we can confirm. Um, Jason, I'll just give you a very quick summary during the first Lebanon War in 1982, a lone tank and a power a paratroopers platoon are dispatched to search a hostile town. Oh, okay. That sounds like a good good old fashioned. 93 minutes, Jason. Oh, thank and oh, what a gift. <laughs> <laughs> So there we go. We'll talk about Lebanon uh, from 2009 next week, and then uh, and then we're gonna take our first side quest after that, and we'll talk about that next week. But next week, prepare yourselves. Watch Lebanon. Um, I don't know where you'll find it, but you can probably rent it somewhere. But Jason, yeah, they can find us all over the place. You don't have to rent us. We're free. Um, you, we are. You can head to our home base, uh, Age of Radio. You go to ageofradio.org/slash/for/screen. And Gundra. Or you can find us on any podcast app you want. Um, you can also uh, you can also find us on the social medias. We're on Facebook. Just search for us. We're on Twitter at FSAC Pod, as in for screen. And Gundra. Podcast. Jason, you, your go. You say things now. At Jason D. McLeod. That is M A C L E O D on Twitter. That's where I am. If you want to talk, man, we can talk. And if you want to follow him on threads, it's at E L O N M U S K uh, 69 420. <laughs> right? Is that, your, is that your account now? That's that's me, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I was at a party one time, and at 1 a.m., I ordered pizza, and it was clutch. <laughs> and Elon appreciated it. Because Honey Badger doesn't wait to eat pizza. Stop trying to make clutch work, Jason. It's never going to happen. <laughs> 
On that note, we are going to bid you all adieu. We take to the skies as we leave this place. Uh, we head to our next location. Jason, I am terrified of our next location, <laughs> what it might be. Mm. Um, because mm. Not because the people, the people are lovely, but I'm a little worried about the current situation um, in that area of the world. But we are, we are brave gentlemen, and we will head there for our next film discussion. But until that moment in time, I will just have to look you in the eyes with all the fervor of a thousand suns and say to you, my friend, God save the king. And God save all the little children and all the little animals and all the little springs. Well, that was weird. Uh, and for Screening Country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. Lebanon! Lebanon off. That's what I'm doing. I'm Lebanon off. Hopefully that's the only time we'll hear that joke. I fly like Piper Gat. If you catch me at the border, I got visas in my name If you come around here, I'll make a more day I get one down in a second if you wait I fly like paper, get high like planes If you catch me at the border, I got visas in my name If you come around here, I'll make a more day I get one down in a second if you wait Sometimes I think sitting on trains Every stop I get to